Good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome to the online adult Sabbath school class for Northwest Houston Seventh-day Adventist churches for August the 5th, 2023. This is the sixth Sabbath of this third quarter. And this quarter we're studying the letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesians while he was in prison in Rome. Uh, this quarter of the study was prepared by Dr. John McVeigh, the president and professor of religion at Walla Walla University. Now, Dr. McVeigh teaches from a historical and cultural pr perspective, bringing a better understanding to the written word. So let's begin uh, with, a, with a word of prayer, and, uh, and then uh, we'll begin sharing. Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much that you wrote a book of history so that we can understand uh, not only uh, what the people were feeling at the time that you wrote to them, how you expressed yourself to them, but also that uh, we will have proof that the scripture is true. Uh, through our study of history. And I just pray that the Holy Spirit that inspired Paul to write these words uh, would help us to understand them in the very same way. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to begin uh, with a sharing our screen. Now, you might remember uh, we've talked before about the fact that uh, uh, the, the city of Ephesus was much like the city of Houston that, that many of us live in. Uh, it was the fourth largest uh, city in the Roman Empire. We're the fourth largest city in the United States. Um, it was a port city. Houston is a port city. It had commerce. It had culture. It had public libraries, public uh, bathhouses. It had uh, indoor plumbing. It had all the conveniences uh, of modern world, except, of course, uh, high technology that we have today. But uh, it was also filled with so many distractions uh, from the pagan world. Um, there were temples uh, to worship other gods. Um, uh, all of them included prostitution. Um, you might know that Houston is, uh, is a sex capital of Texas <laughs> and the sex trafficking is the capital of the United States. Um, we have the same issues uh, in our city that, uh, that the Ephesians faced. And so Paul was writing to a people much like the people uh, of today. And uh, so his, his uh, encouragements to them and his admonitions um, will apply to our church today and our city uh, as much as they apply them. Now, you may remember also that uh, the, uh, there was a huge Jewish community in, in Ephesus, and uh, it was doing quite well until Paul came along and began converting Gentiles. And when that happened, the, uh, the tradesmen, the goldsmiths and silversmiths of the city rose up against the Jews because their business was being taken away by, by uh, Christian converts. Uh, and so uh, the church was thrown out of the synagogue so the Jews could hold their hands up and say, it's not us, it's those people of the way, which is what the Christian church was called. And so uh, Paul is writing to uh, house churches because the Christians began meeting from house to house since they had no, uh, no church building, no synagogue uh, to meet in. So that's the situation that we find ourselves in is, as Paul writes this letter. Now, I'd like uh, to recommend uh, some books that I have found extremely interesting in my study. And uh, one is the Archaeological Study Bible. Uh, you can buy these at, uh, uh, online or at the Christian bookstore if you, if you wish. Um, it, it gives uh, archaeological proofs. Uh, it gives some cultural background. Uh, it, it's quite a, a helpful tool in understanding, especially the Old Testament, but also New Testament times. Uh, and then the Cultural uh, Background Study Bible. Uh, is another one that uh, that I find really fascinating, uh, and that's we'll be talking a lot about culture uh, uh, as we go through uh, the Book of Ephesians. Uh, this is a really good study Bible if, if you get a chance uh, to purchase one. Also, uh, the New Defenders Bible study Bible uh, in the second printing it became called uh, the the Henry Morris study Bible because Henry Morris wrote it. So either of these are the exact same Bible, uh, just different covers. Um, yeah, it is written, Henry Morris was a creation scientist, uh, the only creation scientist to be the head of a major university, uh, secular universities, our ge our geology department. Uh, he wrote extensively uh, about uh, proofs uh, of a young earth uh, from, uh, from science. Uh, so it's a fascinating study. The notes in here are, are, are just phenomenal. So th those are uh, three good books uh, to, to buy if you want to really uh, do an in-depth study uh, of culturally and historically. Now, remember the book of Ephesians uh, is broken into six parts of the six chapters, each one covering a different topic. 
it was a single letter, but a man has, has broken it in these these, uh, these six sections, uh, and they're quite uh, uh, illuminating. Uh, uh, today, when we start talking about chapter three, but we've already talked about chapter one, the richness in Christ. These are all spiritual uh, chapters. Uh, last week, we talked about the oneness in Christ in chapter two. And this week, we'll talk about chapter three, the privilege in Christ. And uh, then we'll go on later to talk about the uh, spiritual walk, uh, how to apply these first three chapters to your to your life. But, but this week, we'll be on chapter three, privilege in Christ. Now, our memory text for this week was, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Uh, I hope you memorize that uh, this week. Uh, Ephesians 3, verses 20 and 21. Now, this week we'll talk about uh, Paul. Paul's imprisonment. Uh, it, it was an issue, and we'll talk culturally uh, about that in just a few minutes. But uh, Paul uh, was imprisoned in Rome starting in 60 AD, and you can see from this timeline, uh, First and Second Thessalonians, uh, Galatians, uh, First and Second Corinthians, and uh, Romans were written before he was imprisoned. Uh, but his, from his, all the other books, uh, from Colossians, uh, uh, Philemon, uh, Ephesians, Philippians, they were all written from uh, his prison uh, imprisonment in Rome. So these are the all the prison letters uh, written by, by Paul, and we'll see why that is important uh, as, as we could proceed through this uh, chapter 3, because it becomes an, an issue in chapter 3. We were asked to read uh, Ephesians chapter 3, and as you do so, identify one or two main themes. Uh, what major points does Paul make? And these these one or two things. So let's let's quickly go through uh, the whole chapter. Uh, we're starting with Ephesians three one. For this reason, uh, I Paul, a prisoner uh, of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles. Now remember, uh, he was in prison uh, because uh, of accusations made against him because he was converting Gentiles. Uh, so he brings that point out right away. Verse 2, assuming that you have heard of the stewards of God's grace uh, that was given, a stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. So he's going to reveal a mystery that was given to him um, on their behalf. Verse uh, verse 5, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations and has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now, the term sons of men, you may remember from Genesis, uh, there were two groups of people in this earth, the sons of men and the sons of God. And sons of men are just people uh, who uh, are worldly, uh, their center, their focus is all about, about them and about the world. And, uh, they're, they're not centered on God. And the sons of God are those who pursue God. So uh, this mystery he's about to reveal hasn't been made known to the sons of men uh, throughout the generations. But if you, if you read the scripture, you'll find it was made known to the prophets and apostles uh, by the Holy Spirit. From Old Testament to New Testament, over and over again, this mystery we're about to, to talk about has been made known. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Ah, the mystery is you and I, Gentiles, uh, are now part of God's family, members of the same body as the Jewish nation. Uh, remember, Jews thought they were special. Uh, they were set aside. They were they were given this message. Uh, they, they failed to realize that they were given a message to share with the Gentiles. Um, and that up until the time of Israel, uh, up to, uh, all believers before that time were Gentiles. Um, Israel didn't start <laughs> until then. Uh, but God has always had a people. And uh, and he's always had his people share the good news with others. Uh, but that's the, that's the mystery that was revealed to Paul. Remember, he took three years after his conversion to study the scriptures before he began preaching. And he dug this all out of scripture. So uh, he had a lot of insight uh, as he wrote. He goes on in verse 7 to say, uh, 
of this gospel, and gospel means the good news from the king. It, it was a political term. And whenever you read it, uh, read it that way. Of this good news from the king, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. Again, nothing of his own. Uh, his, he changed his name from Saul to Paul, which means I am nothing. And from that point on, he realized everything came from God. And he over and over again, he talked about that. And that's what he brings out here. Uh, verse 8, he continues, To me, uh, though I am the very least of all the saints, again, referring to his name, Paul, uh, and the word saints is hagios, which means set apart for God, people set apart for God. If you are set apart in this world for God, you are a saint. You know, you don't have to be uh, have sainthood in the Catholic Church or, or some other place. If you are set apart from the world, you are a saint. <laughs> and uh, whenever you see that term, uh, and it goes on throughout the whole New Testament, uh, that's what it talked about, the set apart people. And that'll be interesting when we get to the word church, and we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, this grace was given to preach uh, to the Gentiles the unsearchable uh, riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. And Jesus laid that out, remember? Uh, Go therefore to all the nations preaching uh, the things that I have taught you, uh, and then I'll come back. So that's, that is the mystery, the plan hidden for all ages. Jesus came and revealed uh, to his disciples. He goes on in verse 10 to say, so that uh, through the church, and Ecclesiastic is, is the word for church, and it means called out, and more, de more technically, it means called out for a public meeting. Um, we are the called out people. You know, uh, when we go back here, we are set apart for God uh, or, or by and for God. And we are called out for a public meeting. Uh, our Christianity is not something that we should hide in, in the walls of our churches, uh, uh, our buildings. Uh, we are called out in public to display Christianity uh, in all our actions and all our, our, our even our words. Uh, we should be a set-aside people, a called-out people. He goes on, the manifold wisdom of God uh, might be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Uh, we are uh, the witness to this world, and the whole universe is watching. Uh, all heavenly beings, all uh, inhabitants of other planets are going to look back on this time and look back on our actions. Uh, so um, we have this message to preach, and the way we do it, the activities we do, the, the fervor we do it with, all of this is reported for all eternity. Uh, and uh, and it will be reviewed and will be seen. So um, it'll be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. Everything Jesus did his whole life uh, was in public. Uh, he made no bones about anything he did. And it was uh, to bring salvation to the world uh, through his shed blood. Uh, verse 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. We should have the same boldness. That, uh, calling ourselves Christian means we are like Christ. We should, we should have the same boldness and fervor that Jesus did uh, to, if we call ourselves a Christian. Uh, verse 13, so I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you which is to your glory. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. He was in prison. They knew he was in prison. Uh, there's shame that comes with being in prison, just as there was shame that came from being nailed to a cross. Anyone nailed to a cross or hung on a tree, uh, that was a shameful thing that, to do. But yet Jesus did it willingly for us. And Paul willingly went to prison uh, for his beliefs. And he'll get into that in just a few minutes. So um, Ephesians 3.14 uh, for this reason, I bow my knee before the Father. Uh, I humble myself before the Father. Uh, remember, uh, we talked a few weeks ago about how uh, when a, a person was captive to a king, he would uh, lay down in front of the king and the king would put his foot uh, on his back. You know, I use my enemies as my footstool, that was the phrase. So Paul is humbling himself before the Father. Uh, 
Verse 15, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Now remember naming from Genesis on. Naming is a sign of your authority over something. God has named us. We have a new name. We are the family of God. Uh, we are his because he named us. Verse 16, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you, and glory, remember, uh, uh, was uh, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Holy Spirit in your inner being. <laughs> the Holy Spirit can give us that power, that boldness. Remember, the disciples were, were cowering in fear until the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit entered them. And then they became bold and, and converted 3,000 people in one day. Uh, that was the power of the Holy Spirit uh, in them. And Paul brings that out here after his conversion on the road to Damascus, a place of new beginnings. Uh, he had that boldness. And uh, that took him uh, right to the prison gates, uh, uh, being stoned to death, all, everything, because he had a boldness now, the Holy Spirit dwelt in him. Uh, verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love uh, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height. That's the three dimensions, uh, height, breadth, and length. Uh, that bounds everything and the depth and the word death means uh, is bathos and it means the extent or mystery uh, that fourth word doesn't have anything to do with dimensions uh, you know uh, breadth length and height are the dimensions the depth means the extent of this mystery uh, verse 19 and to know uh, the love of christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of god and now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, uh, to, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So again, he, he says, uh, God does this. He is the one who abundantly uh, 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 gives us more power than, than we could ever imagine uh, and gives us boldness. So. So that, that's, uh, that's chapter three, uh, just wrapped up. Now we're going to go into detail on each of these verses, uh, but you can see the, the general trend. It's all about God. Uh, these first three chapters was uh, the uh, uh, power uh, uh, and the wealth of spiritual, uh, the spiritual wealth we have uh, through God. Uh, and this, this prayer, these first three chapters is a prayer. Uh, and he'll go into the next uh, few lessons and four, five, and six how to apply this prayer and how to apply these principles to our everyday life. Um, but, but for now, we're, we're still dealing with the, with the prayer part. Ephesians 3 displays an interesting structure. Paul begins this chapter with these words, uh, John wrote, uh, Dr. McVeigh. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles. Uh, then he breaks off uh, for what turns out to be a lengthy digression fo focused on his work as an apostle to the Gentiles. Um, remember, all these Christians uh, that he's talking to were, were Gentiles and a few Jews that, that broke away from the church, uh, uh, from the synagogue to join the church. But it's mainly Gentiles meeting house to house, people who are new Christians. The oldest of them is only nine years a Christian, uh, uh, many, many younger than that. Um, so he, had, he breaks off and emphasizes to these young Christians uh, principles that that, uh, that they would need uh, as they gave up the habits uh, of the old world. Uh, he goes on, uh, after the aside, he signals uh, a return to his original train of thought by repeating the phrase, for this reason. So he breaks off, uh, as he says, for this reason, and he has all of these uh, verses, uh, 2 through 13, uh, and then in, in verse 14, he returns to his original thought uh, with uh, uh, for this reason, uh, getting back to, to, to the reason. So uh, uh, this interruption was, was to get, uh, lay out a principle that we'll, we'll be talking about. Uh, Paul mentions his suffering, uh, Ephesians 3.13, uh, and his later mention of his chains, uh, which will be in, the, in uh, chapter 6, verse 20. Uh, suggesting that he was not under the relative, uh, relatively comfortable house arrest, um, but he was in prison. Yeah, Acts 28, uh, 16 tells us when he first came to Rome, uh, 
he was allowed uh, house arrest. So he could walk the streets of Rome. He just had to have a, a, uh, a Roman guard walking with him everywhere he went. So he wasn't in prison at that time. Uh, but by this time, uh, a year later, after his first year in Rome, he, he went to prison. And this is the importance of that. Uh, being in prison in the first century and in a Roman dungeon was especially challenging. Uh, the Roman Empire didn't run uh, well organized prisons with sanitary facilities and regular meal services. Uh, in fact, the empire had little need for prisons since incarceration was not used as a mean of, means of punishment. People weren't thrown in jail. Uh, people were placed in prison only while they awaited the trial or awaited execution. So it had been decided if he was in a prison cell, uh, he was either awaiting a trial or he was waiting an execution. Uh, Prisoners were expected to provide for themselves and were dependent on relatives and friends to supply food and other needs. We talked about this before. Uh, he thanked those in, that were sending him money uh, and help while he was in prison because uh, otherwise uh, he would have started to death because uh, Rome just wasn't set up to have long-term prison cells. There were no 10-year sentences or 35-year sentences. You just stayed in prison until you were either went to trial or you were executed. So, uh, uh, so this was this was important uh, point. His suffering uh, was was being done on their behalf, and uh, and they knew it. Uh, he wasn't. This wasn't a pleasant time walking around uh, under house arrest as as it started a year earlier. Paul's worries. He goes on. Uh, John goes on to say, perhaps the center of emotional impact of his imprisonment uh, on believers. So the believers knew that he was there. Uh, for them, uh, and they probably felt a guilt over this. Um, since being in prison was an extreme social disgrace, uh, and in in the context of an honor shame culture, uh, these people lived in an honor shame culture. Uh, we we basically do that today. If you know somebody that's an ex con uh, that's that's been in prison and, and released, there's shame associated with that, uh, even in our society today. Uh, and uh, and there was sh certainly shame in those days. Uh, most prisoners that were released uh, had to become uh, shepherds <laughs> uh, because shepherds were people who worked uh, away from a society uh, out in the countryside with the sheep, uh, and they didn't associate with people. Uh, there were very few jobs you could get. Uh, the same today with ex-cons. Um, it's hard to get a lot of jobs uh, when you have a criminal record. So so we, we can... We can uh, um, identify with this uh, this culture that they had because our culture is not that different. Uh, so it was a social disgrace to have their their uh, pro their prophet, <laughs> their apostle uh, in prison, uh, and uh, and for new new believers, uh, this was a hard thing to take. Um, he goes on to say he might fear that uh, some will ask, how can Paul be an apostle and a messenger of the exalted Christ and be a despised prisoner you know how can you have a, a con uh, as your as your pastor you know some of the some of the most powerful evangelists i know are, are ex drug addicts or prisoners uh, people who, who accepted jesus uh, under dire situ situations and became because they know uh, the depths in which uh, from which jesus called them uh, they make a, a wonderful evangelist um, and we can realize that uh, but uh, but a young believer would have problems with some of this. And so, uh, remember, he was writing to a church of young believers. So he reframes his imprisonment uh, in this little passage that we have, um, 2 to 13, uh, helping the believers to see it as a part of God's plan. You know, he was suffering for them, but but just as, uh, as Joseph <laughs> was sold uh, into slavery and became a prisoner in, in Egypt, it was part of God's plan to save his people. And uh, and that's the same thing that, that Paul is trying to bring. Remember, he spent three years studying this. He knew uh, he, he knew from which he, he, he spoke. Um, he reframes his imprisonment, helping believers to see it was part of God's plan. He was suffering for them, suffering for you, he says. Uh, and what appears to be the source of his shame will, in fact, turn out to be uh, for their glory. He ends it in chapter 13, remember? Or verse 13, uh, 
he ends the little interlude uh, with this statement, uh, all my imprisonment is for your glory. And then he goes back to his prayer in verse 14 and on. So that's what this interlude is about, is to help the young church understand that their apostle, their evangelist, uh, is in prison for them, but it's because of God, and God was going to use it for his glory. So that's, that's uh, in a nutshell, what, what these verses are about. So how can we learn to trust God and his ways amid what can be very trying circumstances in your life? Uh, what has happened that uh, uh, people, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, uh, look, uh, they've suffered loss, uh, uh, you know, uh, the loss of a job or loss of a family member or, or loss of uh, a marriage. Uh, they've lost something. Uh, God must be punishing them, right? Uh, but how can we learn to trust God uh, that it, and his ways amid what may be a very trying circumstance for us? And I leave that to you today. It's Sabbath day is a good day to sit down and think about your circumstances and all the things that have happened in your life, look back on them and see how God used those circumstances uh, to eventually bring glory to him and glory to the church and glory to you, uh, even though they may have been horrible times. Um, so uh, so think about that uh, today uh, because Paul uh, reflected on it uh, in these verses uh, and he stood firm uh, as Job did, uh, that this, this is all uh, for God, all for God's glory. Now, what was the long? What is the mystery that has been entrusted to Paul? Uh, Ephesians uh, uh, one, uh, three verses one to six uh, talk about this mystery. And as you study Ephesians uh, three one to six, note the following: First, Paul writes of this part of his letter specifically to Gentile believers in the house churches at Ephesus. And remember, we talked about that just a, minute, a few minutes ago. In verse one, he says, "For this reason, I, Paul." A prisoner of Christ Jesus. Now, who's he a prisoner of? He's a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. He didn't say, I'm a prisoner of Rome. Uh, he's a prisoner of Christ, of God. He's God's prisoner. Uh, he's in prison because of his belief in God and trusting in God and following God uh, on behalf of you uh, Gentiles. And this is an important uh, phrasing in this. Um, he's, not, he's not a Roman prisoner. He's a, he's a prisoner of Christ. Uh, because uh, he serves Christ. Secondly, Paul claims to be a recipient of something he labels the stewardship of God's grace, given to him for you. So uh, God gave him, made him a steward of, of his grace. And remember, God's grace is what? Grace means favor or forgiveness. God, it's unwarranted favor. Uh, so he's a steward of God's unwarranted favor for you, uh, for the Gentile believers, Ephesians 2. Uh, this stewardship or this mystery of grace is Paul's way of describing the commission given him to preach the gospel, God's grace, uh, the good news from the king uh, to the Gentiles. Uh, and uh, we're supposed to compare that to verse 7 and 8, and we'll get to verse 7 and 8 in a few minutes. Um, in verse 2, uh, uh, oh, here it is, 2 and 7 and 8. Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. Uh, remember, he's not there to teach him. Uh, whoever he left behind as pastor, and if you read Timothy and Titus, uh, they be, they were pastors of this church. And later, many, many years later, um, John the Revelator would be a pastor of this church. But all those that were left behind, so he's assuming that uh, they, they gave him uh, the message of God's grace. So that's what he said in verse 2. But in 7 and 8, it says this, of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gifts of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. Again, it's all God. It's all Jesus. It's all his power. Nothing on our own. We can do nothing apart from Christ. Nothing on our own. We need to have that power through the Holy Spirit. So uh, remember, don't grieve the Spirit. Don't drive the Spirit away because he is the one leading us to God. Uh, to me, verse 8 says, uh, though I am the very least of all the saints, uh, my name is Paul, <laughs> I am the smallest, I am, I am the least, because Paul means small or little or nothing. Uh, this grace was given uh, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Uh, imagine uh, for eternity throughout the whole universe, we will be the only creatures that ever told God no and, and survived. Uh, that is an unsearchable riches. Uh, 
God didn't have to do that. Uh, he could have destroyed us with the evil angels. He could have destroyed us with uh, the unrepentant sinners. Uh, it's unsearchable uh, that God would forgive us our sins and let us live forever. Uh, that's the un unsearchable uh, riches of Christ. So uh, the third part of it was uh, Paul claims that a mystery has been revealed to him, a topic he's already written about in the letter, and that was in, in chapter 1, uh, verses 9 and 10, and in chapter 2, verses 11 to 22. In this prayer, earlier in this prayer, uh, started at the very beginning, uh, chapter 1, in the middle, uh, chapter 11 to 22, and now here at the end, uh, uh, he, he again uh, talks about the mystery of Christ, the mystery of the fact that uh, all Jesus came to die for all, not just for Jews, for all people in the world, uh, great and small, rich and poor, uh, Gentile and Jew, uh, all mankind. Ephesians 3, uh, verses uh, 3 and 4, Paul does not wish to be understood as the inventor of the gospel. Paul didn't invent this good news from the king. <laughs> if there's good news from the king, who, who gave that news? Uh, the king. <laughs> So he wanted to make sure that people knew this was not his good news. That's why he uses the word gospel over and over and over again in his writings. This is good news from the king. It's good news from the king. It's good. I'm not the king. <laughs> this is the good news from the king. But he does lay a claim to a God-given ministry to proclaim it. So he doesn't say, he says that the good news comes from the king, but I am the one he picked to, to give it to the Gentiles. <laughs> uh, I'm the courier. Uh, that goes from city to city with that little uh, hear ye, hear ye, uh, here's the good news from the king, uh, as they used to do in the olden days. Um, so he came to proclaim the ministry, uh, uh, the good news, uh, but it comes from the king, not from him. So those are very important parts to this that he's trying to lay out to people who would understand it that way. They would understand it when they read it this way. Uh, the good news from the king, good news from the king, good news from the king. Verse 3. How the mystery was made known to me by revelation. Remember, he spent three years after after he was converted, and God gave him that revelation on the road to Damascus, the city called the place of new beginnings. As I have written briefly, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. So he says, I'm sending you this letter because I can't come in person to tell it to you again. Uh, but as you read this, and in those days, nobody read uh letters silently you didn't go in your bedroom and and unscroll it and read it you read it out loud words were so important that when you had written words on a page they were read out loud uh, they were not muttered in your mind <laughs> uh, so uh, when you read this and they would read it publicly you can perceive my insight into the mystery of christ so uh, the fourth thing uh, he brings out is Paul is not alone in having received advanced revelation about this mystery, as the Spirit has also revealed it to Christ's holy apostles and prophets. You know, Paul is the 13th apostle, uh, apostle <laughs> the apostle to the Gentiles. Remember, there were 12 apostles to the Jews, and he was the apostle to the Gentiles, and to prophets. Uh, and uh, there's an interesting study. There were many, many prophets. If you go through the book of Acts, uh, young girls uh, old men, uh, uh, middle-aged people, uh, both ma male and female, uh, Jew and Gentile, that were prophets uh, uh, in the book of Acts uh, and in the, in the entire uh, Old Testament, New Te Testament. Uh, I found over 400 prophets um, that uh, are spoken of in Scripture. And that, that's an interesting study to go into. Uh, but uh, anyone speaking for God, uh, any of these prophets in which the Holy Spirit dwelt, had this message uh, in a way that surpasses the revelation of God's plan to earlier generations. Ephesians 3, 5, we'll, uh, we'll read that in a second. Uh, the term prophets here probably refers to those possessing and exercising the gift of prophecy uh, among early Christians, uh, house churches, rather than to the prophets of Old Testament. This mystery, which was once hidden, has now become what we might call uh, an, operate, uh, an open secret. <laughs> Uh, so it says in Ephesians uh, 3, 5, which was not made known to the sons of men, remember, uh, worldly people, in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And again, uh, 
uh, interesting reading on the Sabbath day. Uh, read the book of Acts. You can read the whole thing today. Uh, and, and you'll see all the people prophesying over and over again. Uh, um, and it's interesting. A very quite interesting book. Uh, it, it should be called the Acts. Some people call it the Acts. It's called the Acts. Some people call it the Acts of the Apostles. But it should be named the Acts of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> uh, that would be a more appropriate name for it. Because there are so many other prophets that you mentioned in it. Finally, he declares, this mystery uh, is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers in the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. Uh, Ephesians 3, 6. You might remember in Jesus' last six months, uh, his first three years of his ministry was all to the Jews. But in his last few months, he crossed Samaria and prophesied to the Samaritans. Uh, and converted an entire city. And uh, he then moved down uh, into Judea. And uh, over and over again, uh, uh, there are accounts of preaching and teaching to uh, to Gentiles as well as Jews. Jesus uh, reserved these, the end of his ministry to setting an example for the disciples so that when he left, uh, they would pick up where he, where he left off. So um, uh, that is the mystery. We are now all part of one big happy family, hopefully happy. Uh, and the question we were asked is, what if any attitudes, uh, maybe even below the surface, might you hold that uh, contradict the inclusiveness taught in the Gospels? And how do you get rid of them? You know, uh, uh, Paul spent the middle of this uh, chapter talking about, uh, uh, you know, don't uh, hold uh, ex-cons uh, in low regard. Uh, you know, don't hold people, uh, uh, new Christians in low regard. Uh, you know, what what uh, what attitudes might you have uh, when an, even a non adventist walks into the church? Uh, do you feel they're less than you? Uh, do you have do you have problems? This is something to think about on the Sabbath day. Uh, all, God has people in, in all flocks, remember? <laughs> and he's calling them out. Uh, anyone you see is potentially... Uh, are, are probably uh, a believer uh, if they if they're coming to hear the message. So, what attitudes might we we need to to, to think about? Uh, so, uh, think about that today on Sabbath day. What does Paul say about God in actions uh, of of God in Ephesians three verse seven to thirteen? So let's talk about that. Verse seven of this gospel, I was made the minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given to me by the workings of his power. <clears throat> Remember, him, not me. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, I am small, I am Paul, uh, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the uncertain riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things, uh, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known uh, to the rulers and the authorities in heavenly places. And this was according to the eternal purposes that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access uh, with confidence uh, through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Paul again lays claim to being a minister through the gift of God's grace, uh, verses, uh, verse 3, 7. This gift is, uh, uh, like the gospel itself, is not granted because of the worth of the recipient. Remember, uh, at the time uh, Paul was called out, he was responsible for, Christ for Christians being put to death. Uh, he was holding the cloaks of people that were stoning Christians to death. He was calling them out and, and and uh, bringing them off uh, to be crucified and, and stoned. Uh, so <laughs> it wasn't his worth <laughs> that, that, that God called him out, but it's through God's grace. But God saw in him something, and he called him apart and forgave him, and he became the powerful uh, minister. Paul underlies uh, this point by describing himself as the very least of all the saints in verse uh, 8. Uh, perhaps this line of thinking uh, by Paul can help explain this famous quote by Ellen White. The closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty uh, you will appear in your own eyes, for your vision will be clearer and your uh, imperfections will be seen 
and a broad and distinct contrast to his perfect nature. Uh, Steps of Christ, uh, uh, verse uh, page 64. I remember when I was a teenager and I would look at the Ten Commandments and I would say things like, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm 14, uh, so I haven't committed adultery. So look at me, I'm great. I've never killed anybody. Look at me, I'm great. Uh, you know, and I'll go through the whole list saying, uh, you know, I've never stolen anything because I, I lived out in the country and there was nobody to steal from. <laughs> You know, and I would go through all these things and I would say, well, look at what a wonderful Christian I am. You know, I'm just, I'm sinless. And and I, in my mind, I, I saw myself as that. But but then as I as I grew older and began to read, actually read the Bible, uh, which I read for the first time when I was in my 20s. <laughs> and I said, you know, if you look upon a woman with lust, you're committing adultery. You know, uh, if you... Uh, if you lie about your neighbor, you're stealing his character. Uh, uh, you you know, it, you steal time from your boss. You know, yeah, there are all, all kinds of things you could do. And, and I began to see my faults. And I began to see, you know, I sin every day. And, and I began to see my imperfections. And that's what, uh, what uh, we need to realize is we are not perfect. Uh, we strive to be perfect, but we're not perfect. And, uh, and Paul realized that. Um, and, and we need to realize that, too. Um, Paul then continues in Ephesians uh, 3.10 where he says to the intent that I now uh, that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the church uh, to those called out uh, to the principalities and powers in heavenly places uh, so who are the rulers and authorities in heavenly places I mentioned here um and and how does the church an, announce to God's uh, God's manifold uh, multifaceted wisdom to them? So in heavenly places, who are the who are the principalities and powers? Uh, Jesus and his his holy angels, uh, those that have already made it to heaven. Uh, you know, we we know Elijah's there. We know Moses is there. Um, we know Enoch is there. We know that when Jesus uh, rose from the dead, graves were open, and he took captives back with him. Um, there are people in heaven now, um, and they're watching us, uh, and they are, uh, uh, our actions here are being made known uh, uh, to the Prince of Housing Power in heavenly places, um, and recorded. Remember, every word, every action is being recorded, uh, and will be brought before uh, the world on the day of judgment. <clears throat> if your own congregation took seriously Paul's job description, as so we've been reading it, uh, of the church in Ephesians uh, 3.10. And uh, um, how might it change the way you and your fellow ch church members relate to each other? How might it uh, change the way you and your fellow church members relate to one another? knowing that the, the whole uh, universe is looking on and watching. Uh, would there be as much bobbling going on? Uh, would there be uh, dissension among the members? Uh, would there be envy and strife and uh, holier-than-thou attitudes? Uh, so this is something to think about on the Sabbath day. Compare Paul's earlier prayer request in Ephesians 1, verses 16 to 19, with his plea for believers in this chapter. How did he start the prayer and how did he end the prayer in verses 14 to 19? Uh, in what ways are these two requests similar? So let's begin it. In the early part of his prayer, in, in chapter 1, verse 16 and on, he wrote, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and the revelation and the knowledge of him. So he starts out his prayer never ceasing to give thanks for you. Uh, these are people that left a lot behind uh, to become Christians. Family rejected them. Uh, friends rejected them. Business rela uh, relations uh, were left behind. Uh, everything changed when they became Christians. Just as everything may change for you, uh, or probably change for you if you are a, a new believer. Um, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints 
and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, uh, according to the workings of his great might. You know, God has all the power in the universe if we would just rely upon him. Uh, and he has all these gifts uh, that he wants to shower upon us um, who believe. So that's how he started the letter. Let's see. That's the way I see how he ended the prayer. For this reason, I bow my knee before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Uh, by being renamed, remember it says we have a new name uh, in Revelation. By being renamed into the family of heaven, uh, we are now his. His, uh, his ownership is that new name. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with the power through his spirit uh, in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Going back to the power, as you talked about in the first part of the prayer, um, he's now saying how it's instilled in us through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit uh, and the power of Christ uh, living in us. Remember, uh, the disciples received Jesus' power when he sent them out. And here these, uh, these men uh, were able to pray over people and have them healed, even raising people from the dead, uh, healing people, forgiving sins uh, in the name uh, uh, of Jesus. Um, and we have that same power uh, that he granted his disciples uh, when he sent them out two by two. He goes on in Ephesians uh, so, uh, 3.17b, uh, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, and God is love, if you're rooted and grounded in God, may have strength to comprehend uh, with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the mystery or the depth, uh, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, uh, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So he ends the letter as he began, uh, a prayer as he began it, uh, talking about the power and now telling you how to receive the power. Behind the English translation, Ephesians uh, 14 and 15, is an important play on words. Uh, remember, sometimes in translations, we lose a little bit. So when Paul says that he bows before the Father, from whom every family in heaven is named, uh, on earth is named, uh, he's exploring the uh, phonetic connection between the Greek words of father, pater, and the Greek term for family, patria. Uh, in Ephesians, Paul celebrates the comprehensive nature of God's plan of salvation, which involves all things for all times. And here he lays claim to every family in heaven and on earth as a belonging to the Father, the Potter, and every family, Patria, uh, taking its name from the Father, Potter. Uh, this is a very, very good news from the King. <laughs> so so he, there's a play on words that... Uh, that uh, that goes on in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And sometimes translating into English or Spanish or any other language, uh, we lose uh, that that play on words uh, as it was written. That's why I, I say I enjoy studying uh, from uh, from multiple sources, uh, you know, from, from cultural uh, things, cultural study Bibles and, and archaeological Bibles and other places to get these deep meanings that were somewhat uh, overlooked in j just reading the English translation. Ponder this thought. Your family, despite its imperfections and failings, belongs to God. Your family is not the cruel grip uh, in the cruel grip of faith, but in God's caring hands. God loves imperfect families. They bear uh, the divine name. They carry the mark of his ownership. Uh, read the Old Testament. Uh, there wasn't a family there that hadn't had imperfections, and yet God used them all. Uh, and he lifted up uh, lifted them up because uh, uh, of their repentance and their their uh, in their imperfections, uh, their reliance upon him. In Ephesians 3, 16 to 19, Paul asked God to grant believers an abundant spiritual experience marked by inner strength through the Spirit's presence, verse 16. Uh, intimacy with Christ, who is also portrayed as dwelling within, verse 17. And a settled, secure spiritual identity rooted and grounded in love, verse 17. So uh, uh, by God owning us and Jesus dwelling within us, um, we have this unique identity. Paul concludes his prayer uh, report with a doxology, a brief poetic statement of praise to God for what he does. Uh, he praises God, uh, verses 20 and 21. 
Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. Uh, God knows deeper uh, than, than we do uh, what we need, uh, even what we're thinking right now, which might not be what we need. God knows all that. And he's able uh, to give us more abundantly than what, what we ask for. According to the power at work within us, uh, to him be glory in the church, those called out publicly, uh, and in Christ uh, Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Uh, we will we will be his forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> throughout all generations, all times. Paul has been recording his prayer for believers. Ephesians uh, 14, uh, uh, 3, 14, 19. Now he prays directly and powerfully. Paul's actually raises two questions. One, does the passage inappropriately elevate the church, placing it on par with Christ in the phrase, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, while Paul is highly interested in the church in Ephesians, it is clear that Christ is the Savior of the church, uh, since it is Christ who dwells in the hearts of believers. In the doxology, Paul praises believers. Um, in the doxology, praises, oh, I'm sorry, in doxology, uh, Paul praises God for his salvation offered to the church through Jesus Christ. You know, when, when God looks at us, he sees Jesus. When he looks at his church, he sees Jesus. He sees those who are like Christ, Christians. Um, he sees Jesus. And uh, we need to, to begin thinking on those lines. Number two, does the phrase throughout all generations, forever and ever, uh, portray an unending uh, earthbound future of the, for the church with the return of Christ uh, put on hold? Uh, and, uh, you know, some churches believe that, uh, believe it or not. <clears throat> Ephesians exhibits a robust expectation of the future. For example, Ephesians 4.30, we'll get to later, says, looks toward the day of redemption, second coming. Also, believers will experience Christ's limitless sovereignty, uh, sovereign power in the age to come, uh, Ephesians 1.21. Paul's doxology should be read as a celebration of Christ's unending power to exercise on, our, on the behalf of believers. Looking back over Paul's second prayer uh, report, Ephesians 3, uh, 14 to 21, uh, compared to Ephesians 1, 15 to 23, we see Paul finding strength in the cosmic scope of the Father's care, Ephesians 3, 14 to 15. And uh, uh, we read the, uh, the ready uh, ability of the Holy Spirit, uh, the partnership of Christ himself, uh, verse 17, and the immeasurable immeasurability of the limitless love of Christ, verse 18, 19. This is so true that uh, he imagines believers being filled uh, uh, with all the fullness of God, verse 19. And it celebrates these spiritual realities in praise, again, marveling at the abundance of God's power uh, on offering uh, offered to the saints, verses 20 and 21. <clears throat> Whenever we feel uh, the press of problems, temptations, or doubts, uh, we may turn to this buoyant account of Paul's prayer. The imprisoned apostle in horrible conditions raises our vision to the grand horizon of God's purposes and grace, reminding us that whatever our current circumstances, are, uh, we are participants in God's ultimate plan. Verses, uh, chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. And his power is at work in us. Uh, not us, but God. <clears throat> Ephesians 1, 9, and 10 says, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the full, fullness of time to unite all things to him, things in the heavens and things on the earth. And then we talked about that unity that will come uh, after Jesus returns. What blessings from God are especially valuable to you? Think about this. In your life today, uh, if you're uh, a, a new convert or an old convert or a lifelong believer, what blessings of God are especially valuable to you? Uh, practice composing a prayer of praise in order to praise God for it. You know, in these letters, every one of these uh, epistles we read is a prayer of praise to God. If you were writing uh, a, a, an epistle to a family or friend, uh, you know, practice uh, how you would write it. So uh, that's uh, 
that's basically our, our, our lesson for this week. Uh, I hope you got a lot out of it. Um, next week, uh, we'll begin talking about how to apply uh, our spiritual wealth uh, in these first three chapters, this long prayer of, um, to our lives, and how we can become better Christians, uh, better evangelists, better apostles, uh, better people uh, by by uh, trusting completely in God. But that'll be uh, that'll be the future uh, lessons. So let's have a, a word of closing prayer. I thank you for being here today. I thank you uh, uh, if you read your lesson this week and studied it this week. I thank you for taking time to do that. If you didn't, the Sabbath is always a good day to catch up on a, on a week's work. And there were several questions asked today. Uh, the Sabbath is is a long day. Uh, today we should be spending with God. Uh, call your family together. Discuss these issues. Uh, it's a good time to, to do that. To set the world aside. So let's uh, let's have a word of prayer. Holy Spirit who dwells within us and brings us the true knowledge of God the Father through uh, the Son and and His uh, workings as a human being. Uh, he He had all the emotions. Uh, we have. Uh, he felt all the things we did. He did all the things, uh, went through all the experiences in life we go through, and yet it was sinless. And he can give us that a power to overcome sin uh, by his sinless life and his his uh, strength uh, that he, he stood, he used as he stood on this earth. Help us uh, to understand and to apply these to our lives, but help us to be grateful like Paul and see ourselves as small and nothing, but God is everything. Uh, and help us to humble ourselves when we encounter others, whether they be in our church, whether they be in other churches, whether they be in the marketplace, uh, in our workplaces, um, whether they be in our grocery stores uh, or places we shop. Help us to look kindly upon all of your children because you want all of them to be saved. That is your That would be an ultimate goal of yours, to have salvation brought to every one of your children. And I just pray that you would give us the power and the strength that you gave these apostles, that we might cause troubles <laughs> uh, in, in our communities by converting people and bringing them uh, out of the world, uh, away from being sons of men and becoming sons and daughters of God. For so that is your goal, and that should be ours. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and I hope you have a blessed Sabbath, and uh, I'll, I'll see you again next week.